At SpaceX's test site near Boca Chica Beach in southern Texas, a Starship rocket is again fully stacked. Even though Elon Musk claims it has over a thousand additional changes, it initially has an elder sibling-like appearance. The two orbital stacks, Ship 24 and Ship 25 do, however, have some interesting peculiarities that may be seen if you look just a little bit closer. Now the questions are, what's the difference between SpaceX's radical Starship 24 and 25? How does the second orbital Starship differ from the first one? Has Blue Origin made a dramatic comeback? Can Starship make it this time? Are we anticipating another explosion? Have they changed anything between the flights? Let's jump right in. As the second launch is getting closer, people are becoming more curious. Hopefully this deep dive will help calm your nerves. But before starting the video, if you are new to our channel, don't forget to subscribe and also hit the bell icon so you will never miss an update in the future. Let's start the video. We're here discussing the launch pad, where the second orbital starship is ready and waiting for action. So let's play a bit of spot the difference. Starting from the top, First off, have you noticed that the black paint on the nose of Ship 25 is missing? Which is that? Some claim that it's all for the show, especially considering how badly Ship 24's paint has been damaged. Others speculate that a unique coating was added to shield the prototype from plasma during re-entry, but perhaps SpaceX doesn't expect Ship 25 to survive that far. You can see the locations where the hooks used to hoist the prototypes as we move a little lower. They put these large guys on their pads using a device they amusingly referred to as a squid. Before the flight, these attachment points are always removed and repaired. These next two pressure valves are present. There are two pressure relief outlets directly below them. The distinction between the two may be confusing, but don't worry, this is a common query. Those pressure valves then? Imagine them like a balloon's nozzle. They permitted SpaceX to release gas from the tanks, simulating the release of air from a balloon. They have the option of manual control or leaving it up to the Starship's computer. On the other hand, our safety companion right now is the pressure relief vent. Imagine if you were unable to let any air out as you continue to inflate the balloon. Right, it would pop. Well, the same concept applies here. When the cryogenic propellant heats up, it turns into gas and the pressure builds, this vent steps in to prevent a pop, in case things get out of control. Moving down the ship, you will see the forward flaps, which bear no explanation. Not much further, and you've got the SpaceX logo. It's there to just look cool, and that's about it. But check this out, just next to the big X, two essence pieces. They are not just decorations. They're the anchor points for the delirium chains, keeping them in place, especially when strong winds want to play Hall of War. Playing with Mama Nature is infrequently a good idea. See those six hexagon-shaped penstocks below the totem? They are not just there to look fancy, they are the ship's communication antennas, transferring telemetry back to ground control. Further down, there is the cargo bay door. Ship 24 and 25 have a bit of a difference then. Ship 25's door has fresh mounts, but eventually, it doesn't count as they're sealed shut, probably due to stability issues. Further on, there is a special part, the cargo bay access door that lets the crew get outside and work on the prototype. On Ship 25, they moved this door closer to the rocket's underbody side. Ship 25's got a different stinger pattern, which you can tell by the welding marks. Around then, there are two courses. One is the ship's electrical backbone handling power and data. The other takes care of some further specialized stuff, like autogenous tank pressurization, a bit below that, there are two methane pressure faucets. Interestingly, they are closer to the ship's heat guard now, and we are not relatively sure why. Below them, there's a door for penetrating the methane tank and a special box, the flight termination system. This is where they'd put in explosive charges to safely end the flight if effects go south. As we have seen in a former launch, it occasionally doesn't work, but hopefully that won't be an issue again. On the ship's sides, there are two cold gas thrusters to help maneuver it in space. But SpaceX wants to change effects in the future. They are allowing switching these out entirely for a commodity called ullage thrusters. They come with bell such like covers and are located just below the cold gas thrusters. So what's the difference? Rather than using fresh tanks with gas for thrusters only, 
why not just use the gas that has to be released anyway due to the fuel boil off? Super clever idea that also saves precious mass and space, which means you can fly more mass to root. Near to the heat pen stocks, there is another brace of pressure faucets, this time for the oxygen tank. Moving to the bottom, we reach the posterior flaps. They look enough analogous on both vessels. Still, an intriguing difference Ship 24's flaps were painted on the inside, but Ship 25 weren't. Maybe it's the same case as with the nose cone makeup. Both vessels have their oxygen tank access in the same spot. In the posterior section, there's a special plate with connectors known as the Quick Dissociate Panel. It connects the prototype to the orbital tank farm, furnishing energy and power using the special arm on the orbital launch integration tower. Next, these are known as engine bite reflections. But what's an engine bite? Good question. It's a procedure to make sure the engine is nice and cool before it starts. However, the hot engine could get damaged by the cryogenic fuel if they didn't do this. When you see venting out from these, it's a hint that the engines are about to fire. The most significant change between Ship 24 and 25? These new holes are at the bottom of Ship 25. They are a part of the upgraded engine section purge system, which uses carbon dioxide to displace any oxygen or methane to make sure that the engines do not catch on fire during the flight. With the vessels covered, let's peep at the boosters. Boosters 7 and 9 might have a whole new design on the inside, but outdoors? They are unexpectedly analogous. The most eye-catching part is the hot staging ring. Since it was not on Boat 7, Supporter 7, we really cannot compare them. Beneath that, there are four black fins and a brace of cargo points used for lifting. These points are pivotal, as they're what the Mechazilla uses to pick up the Super Heavy. They are also part of the return plan, as the Mechazilla will aim to catch these points. Contrary to popular belief, grid fins aren't sturdy enough to do that job. Further down, below the heavily corroborated forward pat, you will find two further methane ullage thrusters. These come in handy in the thinner corridor of the atmosphere, where the fins are not important to help. Both Super Heavies have pipes for autogenous pressurization, which are calculated on Raptor engine feasts to keep the tanks pressurized. These pipes stretch down to the engine section. As we move down, there is an interesting spot beneath the cargo points. This is what we call stabilization points. The arms of Mechazilla plug into them to give stability when lifting the prototypes. Oddly enough, this area is covered with a putty such-like substance, though its purpose remains a riddle to us. Shoveling deeper, we hit the common pate's position. It's the part that separates the oxygen and methane tanks. Then you can spot the methane access door, which differs in position between the two. On booster 9, it's to the right of the quick dissociate plate. Hard, there is the flight termination box, or FTS, the bone that blasted a hole in booster 7 during a flight without affecting the rocket's course. A touch below, you'll find the ullage thrusters for the liquid oxygen. There is a matching set on the contrary side, and by now you should know what these are for. Between the two prototypes, the thrusters feel to differ substantially in the length and cock of their bell-shaped covers. Next, we see the booster backbones, which help with tailwind and element protection. Inside, these are tanks that store gas demanded for spinning up the inner ring of the 13 engines. On Booster 9, they're slightly stretched compared to those on Booster 7. That's because Booster 9 boasts a redundant CO2 tank for the forenamed purging system. The backbones now also sport Starlink antennas. Down at the base, away from the oxygen access door, two major variations stand out. Notice anything different with Booster 9? That is right. It's missing those two large units Supporter 7 used to have. These house the hydraulic power system, which was responsible for gimballing the Raptors. Still, due to its unreliability, SpaceX shifted to a more effective electronic system. Also, Booster 9 has fresh reflections in its lower section. Like with Boat 25, these are a part of the enhanced engine purifying system. While Booster 7 did have a system in place for the same purpose, it was not as important and demanded these reflections. And there you have it, the crucial distinctions between the two orbital heaps. Whether you've gained a new sapience or just jogged your memory a bit, I hope you set up this comparison amusing. Now, what's not going to fly anytime soon, however, is the European Space Agency's Vega C rocket, Venswy. 
Moments European rocket scene is not quite the hustler it used to be. In history, if you were itching to shoot commodity up using a European rocket, you generally had two choices, Ariane 5 for the big hauls and Vega for the lower loads. Vega had a beaming character as a dependable satellite launcher. But in 2019, that image took a mega hit. Out of nine breakouts from that period, three went haywire. One mishap led to a jaw-dropping 411 million insurance bone claim for the Falcon I-1 launch, the biggest similar claim ever. Another thing, believe it or not, was because someone plugged in a control string the wrong way. That's wow. How do you indeed let this be? Despite these interruptions, ESA pressed on, advancing to the coming phase with their Vega C rocket variant. Suppose Vega C as a cooler, a more flexible kinsman of the original Vega. It's like a Swiss army cutter, allowing for colorful variations to carry different types of cargo. For illustration, a cluster of small satellites or a blend between big and small sets. Oh, and its first stage is powered by the P-120 engine, the same muscle that will be used as a side supporter for the Ariane 6. That is enough neat because it means making these rockets gets a bit easier and streamlined. Everything was looking peachy with Vega C's first successful flight in July 2022. But come December, the effects took a turn. The rocket failed to reach the route, which meant that the cargo re-enlisted and burned up in the atmosphere. After some operative work, they set out that the alternate stage motor, the Zephyr 40, didn't perform as anticipated, losing its chamber pressure, and eventually not furnishing the performance demanded to reach the route. The malefactor? A piece called the throat insert. It's the narrowest part in the engine that gives the escaping feasts a turbo boost, accelerating them up to supersonic pets, which generates thrust. That part cracked mid-flight, causing the engine to lose its thrust. The result? Scourge up a new insert. But surprise, surprise, during a test, the effects did not go as planned. It seems the new insert did not play nice with the current snoot design, causing further engine drama. Long story short, the snoot has to be redesigned to work with the new insert. Indeed though, they're saying we might see Vega C fly again in late 2024, I am placing my bets on 2025. Fortunately, ESA still has two classic Vegas, lined up one, is set to blast off on October 7th. So by the time you are watching this, those satellites could be flying above us, ESA needs to speed up. Now speaking of space and routeways then is a juicy tidbit. Guess what? The FCC lately slighted someone on the wrist for littering in space, seriously. P, back in 2002, the Ariane 3 rocket transferred up a satellite, Echo Star 7. This space television set brought shows to people down in the US. Dish Network, the company behind Echo Star 7, first allowed the satellite would serve 12 times. But guess what? It kept going strong, combing in gains for a redundant eight times. Come 2012, Dish Network Pinky, promised the FCC to tuck the satellite down in what is called a graveyard route by May 2022. What is a graveyard route? Let me explain. Imagine this transferring stuff to the geostationary route, which hangs around 35,000 kilometers or 21,750 long hauls above Earth is not a walk in the Demesne. It's an expensive initiative that requires a lot of energy. Now, to pull such a satellite back into Earth's atmosphere to safely burn up that is an indeed bigger task. So scientists and masterminds around the world decided on a withdrawal home for old satellites, a zone about 300 kilometers or 185 long hauls above the regular geostationary route. It's kind of like a cosmic withdrawal home. Moving a satellite, there's enough energy friendly, using roughly what a spacecraft would need for three months to bite in its regular spot. Placing them there ensures that they will not be a hazard to other satellites for a good while. In fact, Geostationary satellites stay in space nearly ever. It's principally cheaper and easier to boost them up rather than drag them down. But then is where Dish Network tripped up. When it was go time for Echo Star's withdrawal, it turned out the satellite was running on smothers. Rather than making it to the full 300 kilometers or 185 long hauls over, it only climbed up 122 kilometers or 75 long hauls. The FCC, not thrilled. They slighted Dish Network with a fine, marking a first of its kind for not duly ensconcing a satellite. They got a parking ticket. Now, on the face, 
it may sound like Dish got their pockets pinched with a 150,000 bones forfeiture. But hold on, in just one quarter of this time, Dish's gains were a whopping 200 million bones. Doing the calculation, it seems like they set up it more provident to just pay up and use the satellite longer rather than shoot it to its due withdrawal home. It's a launch in diving the growing issue of space clutter, but I'm hoping unborn penalties hit where it hurts, making companies suppose doubly about their space trash. However, this will become a huge problem veritably soon. If effects stay in the geostationary route, if not duly situated or deorbited at the end of their life. Hope you liked the video. If you liked it, then give our video a thumbs up. Don't forget to share.